that's the good stuff right here. Hard, soft literature. I mean, sort of, kind of. I tell you what, I think I'll think I'll check it out. You know, I'm not normally one to destroy books, but so I'm just kind of big for it. Hi, you folks. Fruit and Doggy here to talk about another book series. This one is the Lost Fleet, and I have the first book, Dauntless, and then ironically enough, the third book, Courageous. <coughs> Excuse me. It, this is a book series that by this point that I'm talking about it here in 2019 it has multiple books long it has the first part that goes underneath just the lost fleet and then it has a sequel series after that and let me see if I can oh nope sorry don't have that here I'll probably include it in the video description but it is a multiple book series and uh, what happened was I saw the several of these books at the library I could have picked up <coughs> Excuse me. They were quite cheap But I didn't Invest fully. I didn't go hog wild I decided to be a little bit more hesitant a little more cautious and just pick up two of the paperback ones start off with the first and third just to see just to test water, see what I thought, see if I liked it before I took the full plunge. And I'm really glad I did that, that I was <coughs> quite conservative because I found myself not enjoying the book very much myself. I only read the first one. And I will say that if you look online, if you look at <coughs> reviews for the book series, it they're overall pretty good. And so I'm speaking against the majority on this one, but I just can't really say that I see what is so enjoyable about the book, <coughs> the books, excuse me. Yeah, this is a science fiction series and I'm just going to read the summary of the first one. <coughs> Pardon me. The Alliance has been fighting the syndics for a century and losing badly. Now its fleet is crippled and stranded in enemy territory. Their only hope is a man who's emerged from a century-long hibernation to find he has been heroically idealized beyond belief. Captain John Blackjack Geary's legendary exploits are known to every schoolchild. Revered for his heroic last stand in the early days of the war, he was presumed dead. But a century later, Geary miraculously returns from survival hibernation and reluctantly takes command of the Alliance fleet as it faces annihilation by the syndics. Appalled by the hero worship around him, Geary is nevertheless a man who will do his duty, and he knows that bringing the stolen syndic hibernate key safe with him is the Alliance's one chance to win the war. But to do that, Geary will have to live up to the impossibly heroic Blackjack legend. <coughs> and I will point out a couple of things that I actually disagree with based on this summary. Um, it says that they're losing the war badly. As far as I understand from the book, it's been more or less a centuries long stalemate. Um, I think at this point they're starting to lose some ground, but the way the war is described is that both of them have been just throwing troops and ships into this war continuously and they're just both getting really dogged and tired and uh, war weary. <coughs> and I suppose that was the main part that I disagreed with. It makes it seem as if it's completely one sided already, and it's really not. And working with the main character. <coughs> He is, you know, 100 years prior. He was fighting the war when it was first starting. And I'm actually going to jump ship slightly here. Part of the problem is that this is the first book in the series. But one of the things I was looking up as I read this book was to see if this series was even longer than I thought. If there were 
prequels. I think at this point there actually have been some prequels thrown in, but this was supposed to be the very first book of the entire series, introducing the time period, <coughs> the uh, the world at play. It's actually more of a galactic system. So the different factions, you know, the the alliance, which is who the protagonist is fighting for, and then the syndix, who is the oppositional force. But the problem is that it introduces all of these different <coughs> concepts. It introduces these two factions. It mentions that they span multiple worlds and planets. And it discusses the starships, their spaceships that they're flying to a limited extent, but it doesn't go into very much detail. For instance, you know, with even though it talks about the main character taking place a hundred years ago, it doesn't ever, not even uh, loosely explain what started the war. It, I have no idea, having read the first book, why the Alliance and the Syndics are fighting. Now, of course, to make the Syndics the bad guys, to really emphasize, that's another thing, is that they really emphasize that they're the bad guys. And so they play them a little bit over the top, a little bit of that cheesy villain role. So, for instance, at the very beginning when they call a possible truce and they call on the officers to come on board and discuss a possible treaty or having them surrender, they're just murdered in cold blood. <coughs> Which doesn't make sense because let's say that that's kind of their status quo. That's just how they are. Then why in the world would the commanding officers have even given them the time of day to say, it's like, hey, you know what? We'll, we'll come on board. We'll talk this out. And so on the one hand, it describes them. It makes it seem as if this is par for the course. But on the other hand, it's like, if that's the case, then these people were complete idiots, you know, being lambs led to the slaughter willingly you know they're just cattle but they're sentient cattle who's like okay sure we'll go in we'll get, let ourselves get killed <coughs> and then they're the authoritarian dictatorship and another aspect is that in theory the syndics they launched the first you know, they were the aggressors they started the war and again you know, since it was uh, unprovoked, well, they're just the bad guys. They're evil. They're wicked. And there's no motivation beyond that. It, there's no <coughs> rationale given. There's no explanation as to why this war is taking place. And that's the main issue with this book, and I assume the entire series but some of the reviews that I thought were a little bit more candid, they gave explanations as to, yeah, this tends, these uh, problems that you see starting from the very beginning tend to carry out through the whole way. <coughs> but I don't know what the motivation is. I don't, and honestly, I'll mention something else. When I first read this, uh, multiple pages in, at least halfway through, uh, I thought the syndics, I thought they were some sort of synthesized human beings. They were androids, robots, you know, some sort of auto, um, that's the wrong word, like a golem, whatever <coughs> Termini terminology you want to use, but some sort of metahuman, something not quite human, but... <laughs> unless I misinterpreted something by the end it finally explained that they're basically just human beings and at some point as humanity with our common ancestry starting on earth as we explored throughout the galaxy and colonized different planets there was a faction split between the alliance and the syndics and 
for whatever reason, there was a more democratic side that developed and there was a more dictatorship that developed. But how did that happen? Don't bother reading the book. It won't tell you. And that's just stupid to me. I shouldn't read the introductory book to an entire series be introduced to all these different concepts and ideas but know so little about any of it and then be expected to well just keep reading and over time he'll finally flush this out he'll explain what these different factions how they formed why they formed why there was a split why there was a rift how that all took place <coughs> he'll i mean i just don't buy that i mean if i i gave them the benefit of the doubt having read this entire book hoping at some point there'd be some clarity to any of this and there just wasn't and to me that's just inexcusable <coughs> no i mean if there was just so much being explored and so much depth and like you know the character was being developed so richly then you know we're gonna have to build up into this at some point but no the main character <coughs> felt like it was just going through a cycle because how to put it he gets thrown into this hero role that he never wanted he is uh i mean he went into hibernation basically expecting to die but he manages to <coughs> You know, miracle one, miracles, he's rediscovered 100 years later, thought out, and so on and so forth. But then he finds out that he is basically this absolute hero to his people. He has been enshrined as a war, you know, legendary war hero. And he has no interest in that. But because he becomes the senior commander with, you know, the people self-sacrificing themselves they threw themselves to the lion's den and got killed and you know he takes the mantle and he just kind of keeps repeating himself i do that all the time myself but what he does is oh, i'm not really <coughs> into this i've got to balance this whole idea that they idolize me and i can't crush that but I also have to get them to realize that I am a mortal man and that I'm not perfect, I'm not flawless, yet because everybody else is so incompetent, he then kind of fulfills, it becomes somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So throughout all those years <coughs> of this war, with both sides just throwing everything they can into it, which again, you would have come to, you would think after a certain point where they're just continually fighting this grudge match that they might attempt something different, but they basically just throw everything they can into the fight. And then as they keep using up their resources, everybody keeps dying fast. And so everybody is a greenhorn. <coughs> Which, it doesn't even matter anyways, to some extent, because it seems that they've taken on this commando approach where you just charge in, guns a blazing, that's how you fight a space conflict. And it, it sounds really stupid, I think. I just can't imagine that that would really become military standard protocol that you just go in guns blazing over and over and over and over again i can't fathom that i really can't and honestly i could just keep going on and on and on with all the different problems in this book but i think i'm at this point instead of going into such detail i'm just going to basically bullet point it because <coughs> i don't want this to be a 30 minute video let's see here so again i've already touched on this but a big problem with this book series was the introduction of so many different elements but they aren't explained well they're brought up very vaguely the main character is idol on one hand some of the people here worship him 
On the other, they think he's just this old relic. They can kind of push him aside, ignore him. He shouldn't really be taking the mantle. But again, even within that branch, there are people who are completely incompetent. And then there's people who somehow they're a little bit more sharp. Somehow they're not falling in the same trap of just fight commando style. <coughs> Excuse me. Even though this is a science fiction story where you're traveling through the cosmos and you have multiple battleships and a big part of the story would be the fights, they're very poorly described. And it starts with how vague the book is with the description of the battleships in the first place. I have no idea their measurements, their scale, their scope, how many people are on board any of the ships. I just, I'm not aware of any of those details. And not knowing those basic factors, when you're dealing with one fleet, then Dealing, uh, going to battle with a completely different feat of enemy combatants, <coughs> it's the lack of detail continues there as well. And for instance, if I were to try and describe a battle between pirate ships and, you know, um, a Navy force trying to quell them and quash them, bring them in to face justice, that'd be somewhat difficult, but it'd be them trying to position themselves on the ocean, on the sea, so they can shoot their cannons and blast the enemy ships, so they can <coughs> lash onto them and then uh, bore their ship and then start uh, laying into them you know pirate versus the navy so on and so forth those are the different things I'd be looking at <coughs> but the problem is with a space battle one you have more ships in play you have let's just say for instance um, 10 to 20 ships versus 10 to 20 ships if I were to try and describe a navy battle it probably would be more like a handful versus a handful. At least half the same size. And the other aspect is that we're working with three dimensions. When dealing with a pirate battle, it would be basically just X and Y coordinates on the sea. You can't you know, fly up into the sky or dive down under the water. And so in space, you're adding in this extra dimension, this extra layer <coughs> of complexity and trying to n navigate all of that just through descriptions and to make it not too tedious, not so technical that it's perplexing, but also detailed and rich and vivid enough to really be engaging and interesting that would be very complicated and very hard i will certainly uh give some leeway there but the book fails to do it well it they just sort of happen and it's not incredibly interesting and i'll just give a spoiler alert based on what i saw somebody else say on an amazon review is that <clears throat> what happens over and over and over again is that the protagonist leading the Alliance fleet trying to get them back home to deliver that hypernet key they uh, no matter what forces they continually come up against they always skirt by he always manages to save the day and that just seems incredibly silly because Sure, he has some elements that he could use to his advantage, the element of surprise, being a little bit more savvy than the simplistic guns blazing strategy of his uh, peer group, but <coughs> otherwise I think it's just ass nine to think that 
a force that's completely overwhelmed, completely outnumbered, but always managed to win over and over and over again without any justifiable cause. And I was already tired of these trends and this pattern, kind of the vague generalizations, a character who keeps talking about how he can't handle the pressure, he's not ready to be this hero that he never really was, he wants people to be very candid and open with him, to give him feedback and give him ideas. But it turns out that he's actually already uh, thought of everything that they tell him, except for a small handful of times where they're actually giving him some insights that he didn't come to himself. And I don't know, it just it's very annoying how perfect the main character becomes despite the fact that he is self-admittedly not perfect, if that makes any sense. I would say that he's definitely fallen into the category of a Gary Stu, just a very stereotypical superhero, not a superhero, but a stereotypical hero character who is basically bulletproof, armor-proof, uh, plot armor-proof. <laughs> And I think that's, oh, I think the other part that I'd mention is theoretically this war has been going on for a hundred years and there's really nothing to suggest that's actually the case because there's nothing to suggest that either side is really running scant on resources. And if there's so many people dying, as the book suggests, then that would in some ways indicate that the, uh, civilian populace would have to be supporting that population loss, that that should be pretty significant, but there's nothing suggesting that's the case. And again, theoretically, they're churning out ships, you know, rapid fire, and they're having to cut corners, but with all the different features on the ships, there's nothing to really suggest that that's the case, that they're missing anything that they've really had to trim the fat and make it just a bare bones uh, combat capable only ship that it has no fringes or frills but no it, it's basically home away from home the food is kind of cruddy but that seems to be the only complaint <laughs> so I don't know I was just very unimpressed with this this book. I'm not going to get into the series. I'm not going to give it a second chance. I wasn't too interested in it. And honestly, I thought it was just so bland, so trite, that I would say this is, this is burn it category. If you're going to take on such a theoretically rich and engaging scenario as you know the far distant future space travel <coughs> space combat then you sh this should be i mean this is pathetic you know it's not deeply engaging it's not richly developed it's not exciting exhilarating and interesting it's humans versus humans because they split off at some point and it's as basic as good guys versus bad guys, honest uh, democratic people versus dishonest, disloyal, stabby in the back, cowardly uh, authoritarians. I mean, sometimes it's as simple to boil down two human forces fighting against each other in those ways, but you have to develop it much better than this. I thought this was just absolutely pathetic and I don't recommend it at all. I am, I'm just completely done with it. And I know that the books are otherwise fairly popular. They're otherwise well reviewed. So I'm the oddball, I'm the goofy one who doesn't uh, agree with the majority. So, you know, I don't know. <sighs> but anyways, if you completely disagree with me or if you've changed your mind, feel free to let me know. 
I mean, I'm cool either way. I'm not. You're not gonna point anything out to me that's gonna change my mind because you can't point anything else out to me because I read the book and there's nothing there. <laughs> that's why I don't like it. But anyways, folks, sorry for being so bitter. I'm just really annoyed at wasted potential. But anyways, have a good one. Read better stuff than this. See ya.